All right, guys, time to talk another masterpiece, which has been a little bit. And the f Jesus Christ! I had to throw something in here because there's going to be no humor in this fucking video. Those puppets will fucking creep up on you anytime. But I knew well before I started this channel that there was going to be two types of videos that I would do on here. And one is going to be the more common one which is just, I inject a lot of humor and picking shit apart and stupid observations and stuff. And mostly with probably 90% of the films that I'll, I talk about on here in the past and that I'll continue to well into the future. Probably around there, 90%. Uh, then there's that special 10%. That's just near masterpieces or masterpieces or perfect films, which I've said on here many times, you won't hear me refer to a film as perfect more than a handful of times, maybe, maybe two handfuls at the most, at the very most. This isn't a perfect film. But this is, this is a fucking near masterpiece. This is Mario Bava's 1966 gothic ghost story, Kill Baby Kill. And this is only two years after A Bay of Blood. Well, not A Bay of Blood, fucking uh, Blood and Black Lace. Which, just the lighting in that movie and the use of color is fucking phenomenal. And obviously was a huge influence on Dario Argento. Same with this movie. Like, I'm pretty sure if I recall correctly, Argento has referenced this movie as being a huge influence on Suspiria. And you can see it, man, like all over the place. But Bava, I always kind of have to be in a certain mood to watch Bava. And yeah, I have the lights dimmed and shit because this is one fucking atmospheric, creepy fucking movie. And it's so well done. So I'm setting the mood here. We're getting, getting nice and settled into the gothic, creepy ghost atmosphere. But I have to be in a... A certain mood to watch Baba. This has nothing to do with that I think he's a fucking master. Like, one of the greatest directors, like, in my top ten. Same with Argento, same with Fulci. But Fulci, I can watch pretty much whenever. And Argento, I can watch whenever the fuck. Like, if he can, Argento can be on my screen whenever he wants, basically. But it takes, like, a certain mood for me to throw a Baba film on. But man, when I'm in that mood and I get to watch a rewatch a Baba film, it's fucking sublime, man. It's so good. And just the fucking atmosphere in this movie is it's fucking amazing. Like it is it is dripping with atmosphere. This film is so fucking hauntingly atmospheric that I consider this one of the greatest ghost films ever. Like, of all time. Like, just between so many things I'm going to talk about here. So strap in. This is going to be a fucking uh, decently long video. But just, oh god, the atmosphere of this movie is just stunning. And then just the gothic tone and feel here is so effective. And just Baba is so stylistic. Like, with every movie that he makes. Like, and I always cite A Bay of Blood. That's probably why I said that instead of Blood and Black Lace. As my favorite Baba film. And a lot of that has to do with that I've, I've said. I've, this is the second Baba film I've covered on the channel. Which is a fucking crime. Like, 200 films in the last five months that I've covered. But... A Bay of Blood I always consider. And I hate that fucking name. Twitch of the Death Nerf. The, one of the greatest names for a fucking horror movie ever. Like, I, I do not like A Bay of Blood. It's always Twitch of the Death Nerve. Will always be better than that. But I always cite that as, in my opinion, and I know a lot of people agree with this, as the most influential film in leading to and shaping and molding this, the slasher genre. Well, before Halloween and Black Christmas and all that, we had Twitch of the Death Nerve. Blood and Black Lace is considered by most people to be one of, one of, if not the giallo that kicked off the whole giallo craze in Italy. 
when Bird with the Crystal Plumage by Argento came out, that's kind of when it exploded. But with Blood and Black Lace is cited by so many people as like the first Giallo. So you, this fucking director has started like the Giallo genre, started the fucking slasher genre. Like it's unreal what this guy has done in his career. And different from Argento and Fulci, where a little few decades into their career when they just started going on a downward slope, unfortunately, Bava never. Like, Bava's had a steady, amazing, fucking mesmerizing career throughout his entire career. Like, I can't think of a Bava film I don't love. Off the top of my head. I really can't. So just from beginning to end, this guy has just been a fucking master at directing. And I'm just going to blanket that instead of talking about it throughout the video because his directing is just fucking masterful. So blanket that all over this because I'm not going to mention it again because I'll be saying it over and over and over again. But this was his return to gothic horror and stuff. We had Black Sunday and then we had Black Sabbath, which is another film that I, this is a film that I watch every October, Kill Baby Kill, and Black Sunday. Not Black Sunday, Black Sabbath. So confusing with the two fucking names of those. But Black Sabbath and Kill Baby Kill are both Bava films that I watch every October. And I knew I was going to be doing this, uh, covering this movie. I just didn't know in the next few days when I wanted to do it. And then I just got in that mood like a few hours ago. And I said, all right, like that's it. And like I decided on it earlier today. And I said, I'll see if I get into that mood later tonight which later tonight for me was like 12 hours later because it's fucking almost four in the morning. Perfect time to to fucking watch this movie though. It was like three in the morning, 2.30 in the morning. And just everything about this movie is just near perfect. And the score in this, even though the score in this was mostly stock music and like music that was used in there's some of the score in here was used in Blood and Black Lace and stuff. There's not an original score here. But the music, the main theme here of the, just like the childlike lullaby that plays is so fucking effective. Like, it's so good. It's so creepy. It adds even more to the atmosphere, more to the gothic tone and feel of this movie. It's absolutely fucking stunning. And I just got to talk about the fucking lighting. Like... Argento is a master. Don't get me wrong with lighting. Like, if you see my Suspiria video or any of the videos I did on all of Argento's films from the 70s to the 90s, like early 90s, praise the shit out of him always. Especially with Suspiria, Inferno, and just with his real colorful films. But Bava is just on another level. Like, to the point that I don't even know how he does it. Like, I'm not a cinematographer. I'm, I'm not, I don't, I'm not big into like lighting and shit in film. I don't know like how they work that, like <laughs> for the most part, besides from just watching them, watching film. But God, the fucking color and lighting in this movie, like you, in almost every shot, like almost every scene, there's, over here will be like a blue color and then over over here is yellow and then green over here and it's just the colors are all separate but they all just blend together so fucking perfectly and it's like i don't know how he does it like do they just have colored lights that they shine at different fucking parts of the scene i'm guessing that's that's how they do it but just think of the work that that takes for an entire film and a lot of this movie, it's it's been debated actually, but Bava has said that this was mostly improvised, this movie. And then critics and stuff and people who like always like look into Bava's career and reappraise his career and stuff pretty much kind of deny that and say that it was like heavily scripted and stuff. So and it feels like it's really scripted. It doesn't feel like it's it's improvised that much. So I don't know if that was just Baba just just bullshitting. Like <laughs> I don't know. But just even if it was, that makes it even more unreal. That this is 
that the possibility that this film was heavily improvised. But I don't think it was. Like, I really don't. And then just the sets in this, every fucking set looks fantastic. And just the fog and the spider web, cobwebs everywhere, and the gothic statues and shit. It, it's fucking unbelievable what he did with this movie. And I, my, my mind is going to keep going all over the place. So if I, you should know that by now, people who watch. But when I mentioned Twitch of the Death Nerve, Bay of Blood earlier, as I cite that as usually my favorite Baba film. I think that has a lot to do with, like, slasher films are my favorite subgenre of horror, which I say all the time. So I, usually that's probably why I always cite it as that. But when I really think about it, it's pretty much a three-way tie between Twitch of the Death Nerve, this movie, and uh, Lisa and the Devil. Which, what a fucking masterpiece that movie is, man. I can't wait to talk about that shit. But, oh, the fuck, just everything about this movie. And, and the acting's great, too. Like, everyone does phenomenal in this. For a film from in Italy from 1966, it still holds up amazingly. It really does. But just everything, the directing, the cinematography, the sets, the atmosphere, the tone and feel of it, the lighting, the coloring, the, fucking, the editing, the, some, the, the camera shots, and, and, and everything is fucking unreal with this movie. So let's actually dive into the fucking movie now. <laughs> I told you, strap in, we're at 11 minutes. This is going to be a while. And then we have Irina, who ends up running away from the Villa Graps, which is where this Baroness lives in this... I forget where it is. I don't even think they say. It's like in Central Europe somewhere, in the mountains, and it's in the early 1900s, which we find out later when we see... Um, Melissa, the um, ghost girl who haunts this village, when we see her uh, coffin in the tomb, it says that she died in, 80, in 1887. And then they mention that it was 20 years ago. So it's 1907 here in, in this film. So we see Irina running and screaming like a mad woman as we hear spirits moaning. And then she climbs up into her, like, I don't know if it's her house or something, but she's standing on a platform and she's looking down at a... Uh, a fence with like sharp fence posts and stuff on top of it and just we don't know at first but it seems like she was either pushed or she fell or something like that and she falls onto the fence post and impales through her body and then we just get the title kill baby kill on the screen and the credits go through that with just the still shot on the body on the fence during the whole credits which is fucking awesome like i love that so much just focusing on that image during the whole credit sequence is so good and we have dr paul airway who ends up coming to this town in horse and carriage to do an autopsy on irena's body to find out if it was foul play or if it was an accident and just the shot of the men like carrying the coffin in the distance when they first show when he first shows up in the horse and carriage such a great fucking shot like there are so many shots in this film that are absolutely amazing that it, this movie is just like a cinematic marvel whenever i watch it which is like i said like every fucking october absolutely and it never ceases to blow me away every single time Every time I watch this film, same with Lisa and the Devil, same with the Bay of Blood, same with Blood and Black Lace, same with Black Sunday, same with, like, every fucking Baba film, pretty much. It just blows me away every time I watch it. This guy was, oh my God, what a fucking master. And we have his son, Lamberto Baba, who was assistant director on this and obviously went on to have a great career of his own which, with some classic amazing movies, which I can't wait to discuss in the future also. And then just, just how desolate and barren and gothic the town looks, this little village. I can't even call it a town. It's like a, a village, basically. Just again, the sets, it, they look phenomenal. And the lighting and colors everywhere, which is different colors all over the place. Like every scene looks like that. Every scene's presented that way, shot that way. And it just looks so fucking good. It's so eerie. 
this film is so eerie. It's so creepy. And then let's just talk about Melissa for a second. The little ghost girl here, which Baba looked for hundreds of young girls to play Melissa in this movie. Seven years old, the ghost of Melissa in this movie. And he couldn't find one. The fact that a young boy played Melissa in this is unreal too. Like, I didn't know that when I first saw this movie years ago. I had no idea that was a, that was a young boy playing the role of Melissa. And honestly, like, to this day, I think that Melissa Grapps is one of, one of, if not the creepiest, terrifying fucking ghosts in a, in a horror film. Like, ever. And it's not like, and this is why it pisses me off when I watch, like, modern movies and stuff. It's been the last few decades, the Conjuring movies and Insidious, and don't get me wrong, I enjoy those films. And, like, all those types of movies and stuff. All the ghost films and everything, which obviously goes the CGI route so many times with effects and stuff like that. It just never looks as good. It never looked, the ghosts never look as creepy, never look as effective, never looked as eerie, never look as terrifying as the ghosts of Melissa in this movie. And it's just a, a young boy with a blonde wig and maybe like makeup to make him look pale. To make her look pale. That's it. There were no other effects on, the, on, on this person's face. On this kid's face. At all. And just the fact that that's all it took. To make this ghost look fucking terrifying. Every time that you see her in this movie. Is just. It's, that's an absolute marvel to me. That's unbelievable. Kind of how I always say with demon movies. I don't think I've ever even mentioned it on the channel, but with The Exorcist, with the effects of, with Reagan in The Exorcist, with the, her with her eyes rolling back and the white eyes and the throat bulging out, and all the effects on Reagan in The Exorcist had never been rivaled for me in a, in a demonic movie, a demonic possession movie, like ever. And it's just, it's, it's so fascinating to think about that, though. This movie is from 1966. Fucking almost half a century ago. More than that. Right? I don't know. I'm not doing math at four in the morning. But fucking all this, all these decades later, just the, sim the simplisticness of the effects on her, which, like I said, there's like none. And not being able to be still so effective all these decades later. When we've had such a big growth in you know technology and in effects work and makeup effects and all of that. And nothing comes close to like the ghost in this movie. And the same thing with Reagan and the Exorcist. Of all the advancements we've had in practical effects and makeup effects and everything like that. Nothing has come close to Reagan in, in The Exorcist with the effects on her. And I just think that's absolutely, that's so interesting. That something that can be made so long ago, so cheaply, compared to 95% of the horror films that are made since then, can't capture how effective that these characters and stuff are in these films. Like, it's absolutely stunning. And then Dr. Uh, S-Way Paul, he ends up meeting with um, Inspector Kruger to do the autopsy. And um, let me see here. My notes are all over the place for this. That's right. And then Irina, we find out, was made at the uh, Villa Graps, which is, like I said, this like central Gothic building in here that the Baroness Graps lives in, who we find out later is a medium and is basically who's Melissa's ghost is basically like using to curse the villagers and stuff in this village. And just the shot of Melissa swinging on the swing and how the camera just goes forward and back like that. And her giggle, man, 
Like, just <laughs> her giggle and laughter in this movie, again, is so effective. It's so creepy. It's so unsettling that nothing is, is top fit for me. Like, like, I can't think of something at the moment. Again, it's only like four in the morning. So. But I really can't. Like, every time, every year I watch this movie and I just say the same thing. Like, just the look of her, the fucking, her laughter, the shots of her, everything. One of, if not the best ghosts in, in a horror movie for me. And I gotta stop, uh, I gotta fucking move this along because <laughs> this is gonna fucking go on and on, man. And then we have Monica who's a medical assistant who witnesses the autopsy and we find out that there's a silver coin in Irina's heart and we find out that the whole town is so superstitious with everything going on with Melissa's ghost and that we find out later that there's been like 10 deaths of all perfectly young healthy people like rational people like that would not kill themselves or harm themselves in any way all have died from being cursed and marked for death by Melissa's ghost. And they have this whole, because of the superstition, they end up putting these silver coins, a silver coin in the heart of everyone who dies in this town as like a talisman for them to be buried and then not have their ghosts come back and haunt the town. It's such a great fucking story, man. Like, the just the story alone and the script is fucking phenomenal in this. Like, it's so good. And this was, like, not a big production for Baba. Like, when he first started doing this movie, it was supposed to be a much, like, lower budget. And it is low budget. But, like, it was... It turned kind of into a bigger film than it was ever meant to be. Like, this is supposed to be, like, a smaller scale project for him. And ended up just turning into one of, in my opinion, his, his fucking masterpieces. Which, like I said, most of his movies are near masterpieces. And we have a cat in here. No no cat scare. That's why I fucking love you, Baba. Fucking, see, you don't need to have fucking cat jump, stare, jump scares in a fucking movie. And Baba knew that back then. People would just watch more fucking Mario Baba films... We wouldn't have the insane amount of millions of cat jump scares, which I don't even call them that anymore. And people who watch, you know what they are now. They're not fucking cat jump scares anymore. I solved that issue and I'm working on the uh, friend, uh, innocent person creeps up on someone, scares the shit out of them jump scare as a way to fix that shit. And that's coming. Still racking my brain on that. But you just hear a cat. And it fucking walks down the alley. And fucking Paul turns around and looks at it. That's it. There's no jump scare. Nothing. And there are like two or three jump scares in this movie. If you can really even call it that. Like in the way that we refer to a jump scare today. Today a jump scare is just with the loud fucking music. And then down And fucking oh shit. Not like that at all. It's done so well. That's the type of jump scare that I would love to see in so many more movies nowadays. And we really don't get that. Man. It, it's a fucking shame. And then Paul's attacked by two of the peasants and Ruth, who is the town witch, sorceress, whatever you want to call her, intervenes. And then we get the first shot of Melissa when she's visiting Nadine, who's a, a daughter of one of the locals in the village. And... She's pretty much marked for death. Then we find Ruth, the sorceress, ends up coming to Nadine and just does like this weird fucking sorcery. And like, it doesn't even seem like sorcery. Like she has potions and shit, but she has like, she just takes like these, this like handful of herbs and just starts whacking her on the fucking back with it. Like, I don't know what that's supposed to do to save her like from being killed. Because it doesn't. But like she has her mom to, uh, pull her, her dress down and stuff. like, And you don't see anything. It's the fucking 60s obviously. But you just see her bare back and she starts whipping her with this. And Paul questions her about this, about everything that she, he sees her doing. That to him, you know, he's a fucking doctor. 
and this is like witchcraft to him. This is like unheard of. This is like this is shit that you should that should not be going on here. That this is no way to be saving this girl's life, which he doesn't obviously believe in any of this Melissa curse and ghost shit anyway at the beginning. And Paul questions her about the coin in, in Irina's heart during the autopsy that they find. And she ends up basically admitting without saying it that she's the one that puts it there, that put it there and puts them in pretty much everybody who's died in the past from the curse of Melissa Grops. And there's another dead person who shows up who they don't really show at all like who it is. It's just like a, a dead body turns up and you, it's already covered. So we don't know who it is. But someone else was cursed by Melissa and killed. And Ruth tells Carl the, and I'm going to fuck this word up. <laughs> Burgermeister. Burgermaster. Burgermeister. The, the subtitles say fucking Burgermaster. But when they... The way they pronounce it is Burgermeister. He, he's a fucking guy who works there. That, that's what he is. <laughs> and she, Ruth ends up telling Carl to bury this new body and stuff before Paul, the doctor and stuff, sees that someone else has died and he's going to want to do an autopsy and everything and disturb the whole super, superstition and maybe possibly have this person who just died come back as a ghost just like Melissa to terrorize this village. And then Paul heads to the Villa Graps to look for Inspector Kruger, who left a note saying that he was going there. And we meet the Baroness Graps, and no Kruger. He never, never got there. And then we see Melissa, and uh, Paul sees Melissa for the first time, and even asks her name. And he's like, and she says, Melissa. And he's been hearing about this ghost, like, for the last 20 minutes or so. And this is when he kind of starts to, like, think that something is out of the ordinary, but he's still pretty much hell-bent on this is all superstitious nonsense. This is all just ghost stories, and none of this is true. That there has to be a scientific explanation for this. And just that, too. Just the whole... His character of focusing and just looking at everything from a strictly scientific and medical basis versus the super stitiousness of the whole village and the supernatural elements and stuff is excellently excellently portrayed here too like everything is just so great about this fucking movie i adore this movie and then the shots of the spiral staircase are so good like there's just the winding spiral staircase that goes all the way down in the um in the villa and Later, at the near the end of the movie, there's just some fucking phenomenal shots with that staircase. Like, I'll get to that. It actually won't be as long as I thought it would be. But um, then Monica wakes up, and there's a doll at the foot of her bed. That freaks her the fuck out. It's a creepy-ass-looking doll, too. And then the windows just blow open, and then the doll disappears. And she freaks the fuck out, and she ends up going to Paul, and they get her a room at the little inn that Paul's staying in. And she ends up staying there, so she feels more comfortable. And then we hear this bell. The village has, like, this bell that's rung every time that Melissa has marked somebody for death. And it used to be used for like, if, you know, there was an injury in the village or something like that and they needed medical attention and they would ring this bell or if there was a threat to the village. And ever since Melissa died and cursed this town, every time that bell rings on its own means that somebody's marked for death by Melissa's ghost. So we know that it's Nadine, the daughter of the local there that Ruth was trying to save. Uh, then we find out that Melissa was seven years old and she died in a drunken festival when she was playing with her ball and her ball went bouncing into like a whole bunch of horses that were coming by and she ended up getting trampled to death, almost to death, by a bunch of horses and she was bleeding to death and she ended up running to the bell while she was like bleeding out and ringing the bell and nobody came and saved her. So. It's a fucking brutal death, man, for a seven-year-old. Like, I got an eight-year-old daughter. Fucking, I can't imagine that. Like, just being stampeded by horses. 
by a bunch of drunk motherfuckers, I I would want everyone in this town cursed and killed too. Are you serious? <laughs> Absolutely. And then Paul finds Nadine feverish in bed and just completely sweating and everything. And he ends up taking the covers off of her. And I forget what he refers to it as, but it's pretty much like barbed wire that's wrapped around like her, her chest area, right below like her tits and stuff. And the parents put it there. And again, he just, just looks at this like, this is fucking insane. Like this is fucking, you're trying to kill your daughter. Like, she can bleed out with this thing. And he ends up taking it off and wiping the blood off and treating her wounds. But just shows how just the superstition and how scared all these villagers are of the ghost of Melissa. And the possibility of anyone dying from being cursed by her and killed by her could possibly come back, too, as a ghost and do the same exact shit. Which led to them using the silver coins as talismans and putting them in the victims' hearts so that they wouldn't come back. Just uh, awesome stuff. Uh, then Ruth has the new dead person buried uh, without anybody finding out. So she was able to at least get that done so that an autopsy couldn't be performed and we didn't have another ghost show up. Uh, then Paul finds Kruger, the inspector, shot dead. And he ends up going... Oh, then we, this is awesome. And we get the shot of Melissa's hand on Nadine's window. And just like I said, I keep saying just that. Just the shot of her hand on a window. And then it just, it's panning shot, like really fast. Awesome. Like, it's so good. It's so effective. It's so creepy. And it's just a fucking hand on the window. But because of the atmosphere that is just it, dripping through this entire movie, soaked in atmosphere, and the feel and tone of this movie, and the sets, and the lighting, and everything, just a hand on a window, that's all you need. Like, it's scary as shit. Like, it really is. Like, watching this movie sometimes, <laughs> and then actually finishing it, like, a little bit ago, I was fucking sitting there. Every time I see, like, the shots of Melissa at the window... I would like kind of look at my window and be, <laughs> be like, yo, if I see that bitch there, like she's getting knocked the fuck out. Like no questions asked. Like <laughs> I can knock out first, ask questions later. I can find, oh shit, it was just some innocent kid who was like peeping through the window. Fucking like, my bad. I didn't mean that. <laughs> I can joke a little bit with this movie, but like absolutely. Like it, it really like hits you. Like it really is so well done. It's so effective of how he directed and shot all of this. Like, and everything with Melissa. Like, like I keep saying, I don't want to keep repeating myself. And after she puts the, her hand on the window, then her face peers into, and then she ends up with this little creepy smile. And it's not even, like, creepy, like, if it was in any other context. But just being in the context of this scene and in this movie, it's creepy as shit. And then Nadine ends up, it's, I guess she's controlling her and stuff, and Nadine ends up impaling herself. And I don't even know what the fuck that is. It's kind of like a big, like, candlestick, but then it has, like, a sharp part, like, coming out of it. And she, like, turns it and she stabs herself through the chest with it. And so she's dead. And then we, they go to meet Carl, uh, Paul, and Monica. The burger master, whatever the fuck you want to call him. And that's when he reveals that 10 people have died and stuff since Melissa did and, and the whole curse with her and stuff. And Monica is in town and back in this village to visit her parents' graves. That she actually was born in this village and left to go pursue her career in medicine and stuff. And comes back every now and then to visit her parents' grave. And he ends up telling her that her parents weren't really her parents that there's that he has sealed documents from her you know, fake parents that reveals all that information for if when she came back that he would have that information for her unsealed you know the sealed arm broken on the envelopes and he would give it to monica and it would explain everything and before that can happen we get the fucking such a great jump scare man 
Like, and you, I don't think I've ever said maybe more than once or twice so far on this channel, great jump scare. It's, it, those are like two words that, that don't fucking combine for me, like for the most part. But he goes to the safe, Carl, and he goes to open the safe. And as soon as he opens it, Melissa's in the safe holding the envelope and it, it's so great. It, it, there's no loud fucking music, violins, it's nothing like that. It's just the, with the eerie, subtle score there is that's playing well before that. And he opens the safe and she's just there and it pans in on her and he freaks the fuck out. It's so masterfully done. Like, God, we need another fucking Bava. Like, we need another Mario Bava in horror. Like, please. Like, like, please bring us another Bava fucking universe. Like, I, I really, I would love that. And Carl ends up, since he saw Melissa, which pretty, means, pretty much means you're fucking dead. He ends up uh, slitting his throat with, um, I always forget the name of this. And he, they use this in uh, Twitch of the Death Nerve, too. When they, um, I forget the guy's name. Like when he gets smashed in the face with the bill hook machete. Pretty sure it's a bill hook machete. Same thing here. He ends up slitting his throat and the envelopes that contained all the information on Monica's, you know, true pass and everything, burnt. So useless, doesn't get that information, and Carl is dead, who we find out was in love with, and had a relationship with Ruth, the witch, sorceress lady. And she, when she finds out that Carl's dead, and she goes on a fucking, she wants revenge. Like, she's pretty much just flat out says, like, I don't even care if I die, like, getting my revenge. Like, I will avenge Carl's death and everything. Uh, then Monica and Paul find this family tomb, and they find Melissa's coffin, which is, I don't even know, I guess coffin, right? Like, because I'm sure they had, of course they had wood in 1907, but like, it's, you know, like the stone coffins and stuff like that. Coffin, I guess, in a tomb. So, coffin in a tomb. And we find Melissa's t uh, coffin there, and it says, you know, 1980, uh, 1880 to 1887. Which is where we find out that she's seven. Because Carl says earlier, like, that she was six or seven. I don't know how he doesn't know that, like, exactly that she was seven. Like, she wasn't six. She was, she was in, indeed seven. I don't know how he doesn't know that. Maybe it just slipped his mind. <laughs> just everything that goes on in this village and everything that has happened. He just wasn't thinking in the moment. Or maybe she just turned seven. I don't know. I'm, that's, like, a, the only nitpick <laughs> I'll fucking give here. And then they end up going, Paul and Monica, to the villa and talking with uh, the Baroness, who gives a little exposition here that she's a medium. And basically, Melissa's ghost, well, Melissa obviously, was, obviously is the Baroness's daughter, and Melissa, like, uses her mother, the Baroness, being a medium, to do what she does and to curse the town and to kill all these people and the baroness pretty much is completely complicit in this because this was her daughter and this town village when they had that drunken festival and the horses stampeded her daughter and no one helped her she doesn't give a fuck about anybody in this village like she wants she wants them all dead so she just lets melissa's ghost and spirit and stuff use her as a medium to kill all her victims and everything. And it's implied that there's other spirits also, which we don't see. We hear sometimes, and even with, like, uh, the captions on, it'll say from time to time, like, spirits moaning and groaning or whatever. So there's multiple spirits. And I'm assuming that because she mentions that everyone who lived in the house and the villa died because of Melissa. So were all of them buried? Are those included in the 10 who Carl mentioned that died since Melissa? Or were these other victims that died in the villa and they weren't buried with the talisman in their heart, the silver coin, and they ended up being spirits too? But we never see them. Melissa is the only ghost that we see in this movie. So I don't know. That's interesting to think about. And then we have Melissa's room that uh, the Baroness brings um, Paul and Monica into. And what a fucking great scene this is too, man. Like when she's going through it, 
the room and it's panning to the left and she's saying it's just like how Melissa left it and that she was very meticulous and this was her favorite doll and we see the doll that was on Monica's at the edge of her bed earlier in the film and then she mentions the ball again and stuff which is what led to her death and why we see the ball bouncing in a few scenes throughout the movie and then it just pans from the left to the right and then just I don't even know if I can, if I can call it a jump scare, but fucking like, as it pans to the right, there's a doll, another doll, and then just Melissa sitting there, and it just pans in real quick on it. So fucking effective, so good, so creepy. Oh, I fucking love Bava so much. Who doesn't love Bava? And that's the thing we're talking, like, that I love about doing this channel. And I really do. Like, this is one thing I absolutely adore here. Because you could, I could talk about all the Friday the 13th and the Halloween movies and Nightmare on Elm Street, they're coming, and all the major franchises and, you know, modern movies, the last few decades and well-known fucking masterpieces and well-known movies and franchises. But every now and then when I get to talk, like, about films like this, because not everyone is a fucking Italian horror fan, like, by a long shot. Like, I have a ton of horror fans, and I'd say maybe 20% of them are into Italian horror. Maybe. So, like, doing Bava films and Fulci, to a little less extent like Fulci and Argento, because they're kind of, a, I think they're a little more palatable for people who either aren't huge into Italian horror or that they're just getting into Italian horror. I feel like Argento and Fulci are a lot more accessible for some reason. I feel like Bava is a little bit more of an acquired taste, if that makes sense. If you're a Bava fan, let me know if you understand what I'm trying to say. I feel like he's a little more acquired. And like I know fucking full well that like this video is not going to get many views compared to all my other videos. And I say all the I don't give a fuck about views and stuff and all that shit. I say it all the time. So it doesn't matter. But that's like the fun, one of the greatest parts about doing this is just being able to talk about films like this. Films that you don't see plastered all over YouTube, plastered all over social media and stuff with everybody talking about it, like when Halloween ends and everywhere and Terrifier 2 this 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 month and everything, and the big movies that's been coming out. You know, I fucking love Terrifier 2, but like just using them as examples, like you see them everywhere. When's the last time you saw a video on Kill Baby Kill by Mario Bava? Seriously, like <laughs> when? Like I don't think I've seen and trust me, I used to watch, I don't even really watch other people's channels anymore. Like the channels I've always followed, which weren't many over the last several, several years, five, six, seven years. Even my favorite channel that I watched religiously for the last four, almost five years, I can't watch his channel anymore because I'm afraid that subconsciously, like opinions or thoughts of his or whatever other channel is going to seep into my head, and then I'm going to fucking regurgitate that subconsciously. And, and I just don't like that. So it kind of sucks that I can't watch, like, other channels that, like, I used to love. The only channels I watch now are all the friends that I've made since doing this, and, like, all my fellow channels and stuff that were all in this little crew and fucking... Mike and fucking Gareth and Al and Dave and it goes on fucking like I can watch this shit all the time because everyone just has such a different style and just everyone's so unique and it's it's great it's that's another thing that's just amazing about doing this besides the primary reason that I started doing this for myself for me and myself alone and just from to just have a platform to discuss my love for horror and film in general that's like the biggest plus is all the amazing people I've met in the last barely six months, five months since I started this channel. And I said way back when I started the channel, I said, I'm doing this for me. If I get a hundred subs, 10 of them watch consistently, it's a bonus, absolute bonus. So I'm like at 240 subs almost now, 40,000 views or some shit like total. I more than doubled my money at this point. So I really don't give a fuck. If a hundred of them dropped me tomorrow, 
wouldn't give a fuck in the world. Like, I really wouldn't. Just, but the, just meeting all these amazing people and seeing their amazing content and their channels and being able to collaborate with them. And the biggest fucking perk out of doing this. Like, 100%. Tied with just all you amazing people who subscribe and watch and everything, obviously. But those are the two biggest perks of doing this next to just doing it for myself. Let's get back to and finish this fucking movie because we're almost done here. And I just have to throw uh, some plugs in there as usual for all of you fucking guys. You know who you are. I love you. Fucking, um, but yeah, that slow pan to Melissa and stuff is so well done. And that's just like another example of just, I want that in more movies, like a jump scare like that. And it's not even, like I said, it's not even like a jump scare, jump scare. But it's so effective. It's so creepy. It's so fucking amazing. And I fucking, I love Baba so much. I love Baba. Who doesn't love Baba? And then, not even just with the pan to her. Once it pans to her and you're kind of like, oh shit, like she's sitting there. It's not a doll like the last two that we saw. We just get the zoom in shot. The real fast zoom in right onto her one eye. And you could see fucking... Fauci, like right there. Like I've mentioned in the few, which is a crime too, that I've only covered the Gates of Hell trilogies, three films, Fauci's films on the channel so far. I definitely will be doing more Fauci very, very soon. But I mentioned in a few of those that it is a trademark of Fauci, which is focusing on the eyes and not just like poking them out and stabbing them and eye gags and gore and stuff like that. Just the way he shoots scenes and dialogue. How it just always zooms in just like on people's eyes like this. And then it goes to the next person. And again, it's on their eyes. And it, it always zooming in on the eyes. And you can see the influence from Bava in Fulci's work. Like 100%. And that's that shot right there always makes me think, yeah, Ful that's, Fulci fucking loved that shit. <laughs> like when he saw this movie. Like 100%. Awesome stuff. And then Paul sees his... His doppelganger, I guess. I never really got this. I guess it's just the spirits of the house that are fucking with him. And I would not be surprised if David Lynch was a huge fan of this movie. Because it it really is so similar to... I mean, I don't want to spoil Twin Peaks. Especially the fucking finale of season two. Before the return came back 20 fucking five years after that. But... Skip forward if you like thirty seconds, but I would not be surprised surprised if David Lynch, who again is one of my fucking favorite director directors and people on the planet, saw this movie and was influenced by this scene with him seeing his doppelganger and like running in the room and his doppelganger running away with the season two finale of Cooper and in, in the black in the black lodge in the red room chasing after his doppelganger chasing after him and stuff. It always reminds me of Twin Peaks when I rewatch this every year and I see that doppelganger scene. What it means, I don't know. I'm, again, I'm just guessing it's just the spirits that are coming through the Baroness as a medium that fuck with him because then he just like materializes out of the villa and he ends up waking up with Ruth by his side. And then we get the reveal that Monica is Melissa's sister and the daughter of the Baroness. And that she sent her away for her to go study medicine and leave the village and stuff so Melissa wouldn't kill her. And this is fucking shocks the shit out of fucking Monica. Uh, then we get my favorite shots in this, in this fucking movie. Like, besides, like, all the shots with Melissa at the window and like all the shots of her but the most stylistic shot in this film is when monica is running down that spiral staircase and just the colors man and the lighting with the green and the blue and fucking the yellow and just all over the fucking screen in different places as we get a you know from the top zoom down shot of her running down the spiral staircase and then it's just such a great shot man when it just zooms down all the way to the bottom and it just turns black 
like just like it hit the bottom and it's dark and then comes right back up and then comes back down again like it looks so good and then we get it from below we get the camera shot from below of the spiral staircase as she's running down the staircase and the camera's spinning like this from below and it's just, it's it's fucking amazing it's absolutely masterful like what a fucking amazing few shots that is like absolutely excellent shit and and then the ball bouncing down the stairs too during that shot with melissa's ball bouncing down the stairs as it's twirling from below and stuff and then from above like ah oh, looks so fucking good and then monica finds her own coffin which i never understood this i'm guessing that either it was planned you know that Melissa, like, it was always kind of, like, destined that Melissa was going to eventually kill her sister, Monica, if she stayed in the village. And they just had a coffin for Monica for when that happened. Because it doesn't, it's not that she's, like, a ghost the whole time and she's dead and shit. Like, that's not what it is at all. So I don't really know what that means. So if anyone has a, an explanation for that, I'd love to hear it. Because I never could put a finger on that. The fact that she sees her own her own grave in the tomb. So I don't know what that means. I would love to hear someone's thoughts. Uh, then Ruth goes to the Baroness to avenge Carl's death. And they both kill each other. When the uh, Baroness ends up stabbing Ruth in the chest with a fireplace poker. And in her last few uh, gasps of life, she ends up strangling the Baroness to death. And Paul meets back up with Monica, and they walk off into the distance with the sun shining and stuff. What a fucking masterpiece, man. Like, I don't even know why I say near masterpiece. This movie's a fucking masterpiece. Like, it really is. Like, 100%. And, yeah, this was long. <laughs> this fucking, like, 50 minutes. But that's what's, hap that's what's gonna happen every now and then. And people who've been following for a while, you know that. Like, mean, this... Well, two types of videos, like I said at the beginning of this video. Well, part one, because I'm not editing this shit together. That, I, and I always know it, that there will be two types of videos on this channel. One are going to be completely serious, just talking about masterful fucking filmmaking. It's my video on The Thing, my video on Suspiria, my video on John Carpenter's Halloween. And then there were, all of those are the ones that hit the fucking hour mark, because... <laughs> You, how can you talk any less for them? Like, there's so much to talk about. There's so much to discuss. There's so much brilliance in those films that how can you not? And then the other videos are just like the ones that I can fucking joke like a fucking motherfucker and make just stupid observations. And still could be movies I absolutely adore. But I don't know. It's, it's just, there's a difference. And like, even with my video on The Thing... I even said in that video, the same one, I had to say it in Halloween, Carpenter's Halloween, but same thing applies there. Even if there was something I can pick out, like just a nitpicky observation, or this doesn't make sense, or this is stupid and stuff like that, which there isn't in any of those two films, like at all. They're perfect. Don't you even fucking argue with me over it. I will fight you all day long on it. But I even said in the video for the thing I did, I said, even if there is something or was something, in that film, or Halloween, or Suspiria, anything like that, I won't even mention it, just out of respect for the fucking movie. Like, that's how serious <laughs> I am on some films, and those are pretty much those handful or two films that are considered perfect. And Baba is just a fucking cosmic wonder with everything he's done in his career. So, long video. So. Mario Bava's Kill Baby Kill, absolutely phenomenal. And the fun part about all this is <laughs> the fact that I get to go from this, and now I got to go and watch Wishmaster 3 and 4. You gotta love it. You gotta love horror YouTubing. Nothing like it. All right, guys, wherever you're from, hope you have a great night, great day. And I will talk to you guys soon. Mm -hmm.